Okay, everybody. Welcome to the Molly's Fun Fighting Lupus Living with Lupus Patient Symposium. I'm Molly McCabe, co-founder of Molly's Fund, and I have lupus. When creating this organization, my mom, who is my fellow co-founder, and I wanted to create a place where lupus patients could find information, support, hope, and most importantly, an understanding friend. Today's symposium is packed full of information about lupus and ways to cope with symptoms and flares. We're also excited to bring you updates about healthcare-related legislation. We'd like to thank Pfizer Pharmaceuticals for their generous grant to fund today's programming. Our first speaker today is Dr. Andrew Lasky. Dr. Lasky is a board-certified pediatric rheumatologist with Randall Children's Hospital at Legacy Emanuel. Dr. Lasky completed his medical degree at the University of Illinois in Chicago, his residency in pediatrics and fellowship in pediatric rheumatology at Indiana University Medical Center in Indianapolis, Indiana. When presented with the opportunity to work with two talented pediatric rheumatologists, Dr. Dan Kingsbury and Victoria Cartwright, Dr. Lasky and his wife, Erin Fitzgerald, moved with their two daughters, Hannah and Eleanor, here to Portland, Oregon in 2013. Since the move, Dr. Lasky and his family have enjoyed camping and enjoying to the coast. He has also developed a passion for whitewater kayaking. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lasky. I wanted to give you guys a little bit more information about my journey and how I got here, though that was a really nice conclusion because I am here in Portland now and loving being here. Um, but I think what you need to know is I love taking care of kids with rheumatic diseases, especially lupus. And when you get to work with really, really nice people, great families, and forge a relationship, which you get to when someone has a chronic rheumatic condition like lupus, uh, it's very fulfilling. So my journey, as, we, uh, as you heard, I did my training in Indianapolis, and my first job afterwards was in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And um, uh, after five years, I made the move to Kansas City, Missouri, where I joined another pediatric rheumatologist who unfortunately a couple years later left, leaving me alone to practice. But given some time uh, I and really great support from the hospital there, I was able to build a pediatric rheumatology section of about uh, of, not, of exactly five pediatric rheumatologists. Uh, that, that is a really strong section, a really great hospital, and it's a, it's a really great place where they take care of kids with rheumatic conditions. Um, then I was able to move out to Randall Children's Hospital, which is part of the Legacy Health Group, and work with a couple of really great pediatric rheumatologists who are really talented. And we have a really excellent uh, group of people, nurses, front office, who help take care of kids with lupus. This was one of the patients I took care of up in Minneapolis, and uh, she obviously presented with a rash, not necessarily classic, but certainly indicative of lupus. She also had uh, renal disease. <clears throat> I wanted to talk about the idea that kids do get lupus, because they do. In 10 to 20 year olds, the incidence is about 1 in 20,000 in Caucasians, 1 in 8,000 in Hispanics, and 1 in 5,000 in African Americans. And uh, it absolutely happens, and we see it regularly. In general, for those kids less than 15, uh, it's about 1 in 20,000, and the reason for that is there's a greater incidence of lupus after puberty than before, though it happens in both school-age kids and adolescents. Um, females more than males, as most people know who have any uh, introduction with respects to lupus, and um, as we talked about before, more in African Americans than Caucasians in uh, about five to 10,000 kids with lupus in the U.S. Another patient of mine, this was during fellowship, who is a uh, Native American who presented with malar rash, who also had significant renal disease. So what's different about lupus in children compared to adults? I'm going to touch upon a couple of different 
aspects. One is that in general kids disease severity is more than in adults and that's not individually there are many many adults with very severe lupus but overall children just has, have a higher percentage of renal and central nervous system involvement and one has to just be aware that uh, you really want to make sure you know everything that's going on as much as possible about the disease activity and making sure you're doing everything as quickly as possible to get it controlled. Um, this is a very vulnerable time for uh, people in general, adolescents, with respect to their identity. And it's hard enough to find one's own identity uh, in general, more or less how to have a chronic illness along with the rest of whatever it is to mature. And finally, the relationship triad, the relationship between physician, patient, and, yes, parents. And you cannot leave that last part out while successfully taking care of somebody who has lupus. I have a couple of examples of patients that I've taken care of here in the Portland area over the last couple of years. The first, a five-year-old Hispanic girl from Southern Oregon who came with a, a history of low platelets. And during the evaluation for wondering if she had lupus, she unfortunately had a pulmonary hemorrhage in which she was very sick and in the intensive care unit for a number of weeks and over two weeks on a ventilator. Um, this is something that is not the norm, but it absolutely happens. And it's the reasons why not only is it important to uh, diagnose lupus, as you guys know, but to try to do it as quickly as possible. When it's diagnosed, you can start treatment and hopefully prevent some of these complications. Uh, the second patient was a 14-year-old who presented with leg pain and swelling who ended up having a clot in her leg uh, and on further evaluation had clots in her lungs as well. A uh, lot of chest pain, multiple hospitalizations to try to get the pain under control to get the clots lessened and it turned out that she also had involvement of one of her heart valves. Uh, her lupus is well controlled. She also has antiphospholipid antibody syndrome contributing to causing those clots and um, is going to need surgery to be able to repair her heart valve. This was uh, another patient of mine who uh, presented in the hospital with a lot of edema who had uh, WHO class 5 um, renal disease uh, and of course a malar rash. Adolescence, a time of vulnerability of identity. So th imagine, some of you don't even have to imagine, but think about the idea of um, teenagers, junior high school, high school. What does it mean to fit in with the other kids? Trying to find peer groups, trying to know who one is and, and how to make that work. And while doing so, being told you have a chronic illness like lupus. Um, then, after the diagnosis and trying to understand what that all means, how is one's physical features going to be impacted by going on high-dose steroids and gaining weight, uh, which can be considerable, getting not only facial acne, but, but acne all over one's body. And I think we all know in those times, without a chronic illness, without being on medic a lot of different medications, what it is to just get one pimple, more or less having acne all over one's face. And uh, it is something that uh, it's difficult to, on the one hand, be objective as a treating physician to try to help make best decisions, but to also empathize uh, not only with the child, but their parent who's trying to make decisions about what to do for the child's best health about a condition they know nothing about, listening to some person they don't know and giving medications that causes these problems with their child. It's not easy. Uh, and of course, during all of this time, hitting middle adolescence when rebellion is the norm, when children are trying to gain independence and not do it, doing that with things that are acceptable but not doing that with things like going to doctor's appointments or taking medications is, is quite a tricky balance. This is a patient of mine uh, from quite a long time ago, and she is a really neat young girl um, who 
uh, with her diagnosis needed treatment. Uh, she really, really well put together and her mom was salt of the earth and they had a great relationship and we all, the three of us had a really good relationship. Uh, but imagine, I want to give you a visual with respects to the impact of going from this to this. What does that do? This is after a long course of steroids. <clears throat> Let me be clear, I do not like steroids with respects to what they do in terms of adverse effects. The unfortunate thing is it is a very good immunosuppressant to help control lupus and the goal, not only present, but future goal is how do we use less of this to get the same effect with respect to control of disease. But imagine for this patient who she was prior to and who she is now and what happens over time in terms of her as she's forging an identity. Uh, her cushionoid features went away. She survived with respects to the, uh, the change or the uh, altering image, if you will, but will I really ever know or will we really ever know how that time impacted who she identified herself to be? I think probably don't really understand the impact. So, <laughs> denial. Really can't talk about the treatment of adolescents or adults for that matter when talking about denial. So, common sense and the idea that don't you understand if you don't take your medicines, what will happen? You know that you hurt if you're not doing the things that you know help you. Why would you not do that? Any parent, when you hear them asking their child that question, you sit there and it makes no sense, right? But what we know is that denial is one of the most powerful ways of coping. And adolescent, Children do a really good job of being in denial. And so I, I have a story to share about both parents and patients with the idea of the power of denial. I'm in my office in the clinic room with a patient and both of their parents. And I'm scratching my head asking, I don't understand why we're not getting the clinical effect we think we should be with the, with the treatment we've prescribed. Um, and is there, you know, what's going on? Is there any possibility Johnny is not taking his meds? And both parents are like, no, that is not possible. We hand it to him, we see him take it. It's just not possible. And I'm like, okay. So when I examine my patients, I have them take their shoes and socks off and he takes off his shoes and out drops one of his pills from his shoe. And you couldn't believe the parents' jaws dropping with the idea that for some way their child, who they know is doing the things they're supposed to do, was not. And it was just a great example of what denial or what the power of um, the mind can do, even though it makes no sense with respect to the goal of the treatment. So I, I really like that as an example, never, never be too sure. That relationship triad, you have the patient, the parent, and the physician. And I think in the adult world, though patients bring family members in, the responsibility of the physician is to the patient. That's it. That is what, that is what one needs to have and has. In pediatrics, uh, it is threefold. You have a relationship with the patient and the parent. Without a good relationship physician-parent, uh, you're not going to get buy-in from the child for the most part. Particularly if they're school age, you need a stronger relationship with the parent because the parents basically are the ones who are dictating the care. As the child gets older, it helps to have a stronger and stronger relationship with the patient because um, you're, you as the physician can have influence if they respect you. If, you, if they know you care about them. There is power in that. There's also power in supporting the parents in their frustrations in dealing with their adolescent child. Uh, understanding that things are not always easy, that negotiations are happening 24 seven, that uh, those sorts of things really help when it comes to the idea of 
having the family feeling supported, not only by the physician, but the clinic, knowing that you're there to help, not only when disease flares, illness occurs, but also when um, socially things are going awry. Another patient of mine, one with more mild disease who presented with a classic butterfly rash, but also had um, low uh, white counts as the presentation of her uh, lupus. Again, you can get cytopenias, low white counts, hemoglobin platelet counts associated with your lupus. She did not have renal involvement, central nervous system involvement, uh, and uh, again, treatment amount of steroids that one would use might be, uh, would be less and other immunosuppressants may not be the same as in more severe disease. I just wanted to point out that every pediatric lupus patient does not have uh, a level of severity like some of the other ones I presented. And it's such a cute smile, right? So why might it be a good idea for a pediatric rheumatologist to take care of a kid with lupus? Um, I think it really helps spending three years doing a pediatric residency because all you do is take care of kids 24-7. You learn about the development of them. You learn about the ways of being of adolescence. Uh, you learn about uh, how one's going to develop one's skills in developing relationships with parents. Uh, I think that those are really important and uh, that when kids with rheumatic diseases are not taken care of by the pediatric world, uh, they don't necessarily gain the benefits of some of that experience. Uh, we work in places where our staff are used to taking care of kids. So the idea of making them feel comfortable, having it be a safe place for them, uh, knowing that you're going to get calls from parents, not necessarily that are clinically based, but emotionally sometimes they need that support. Uh, and if you're lucky like I am, you get to work with people who are really good, uh, really um, uh, talented with respects to helping and having people feel good about the care that they get. And that familiarity with severity of disease, uh, making sure one is on the aggressive side of getting the uh, lupus controlled, it's trying to prevent the layers, trying to anticipate further evaluation of other areas, even though there might not be clinical symptoms, maybe we're going to get an EKG and echo to make sure the heart is okay, getting baseline studies, because two years down the road, there may be a problem, and if you don't do one initially, you're not going to know if it was there initially, uh, previously or not. So some of those things, I think, are informative to, hopefully, the good care that these kids get. So why not a pediatric rheumatologist? I mean, why would it, other people take care of kids with rheumatic diseases like lupus? And um, availability and access is really the issue. Uh, there are approximately 250 pediatric rheumatologists in North America, and another 250 around the rest of the world, which is a lot better than the 100 who were in the North America when I started my practice back in the mid-90s. Um, so there are more, but there still aren't enough. And they're still not everywhere they need to be. There are states, Idaho, Wyoming, um, Montana, North and South Dakota, no pediatric rheumatologists, period. They don't have anybody. Oklahoma City, the state of Oklahoma has one for the entire state. I um, uh, feel really lucky that Dr. Kingsbury Cartwright and myself are the three that cover Oregon. We're the only three. Um, so uh, if you want to get in, sometimes it's a very long wait. Sometimes it's a really long drive, right? When I was in Minnesota, I had a patient dri driving from Wyoming to Minneapolis, Minnesota for me to take care of them. We have patients traveling from Idaho and Wyoming to Portland to help take care of them. We have patients from the Tri-Cities in Washington or from the other side of the state in, in Oregon to come see us. And that three, four hour drive is a burden. You throw a couple of younger kids in there with the patient, everyone's a little bit on edge, just to say. So it, it's not ideal. It, it's, it's not ideal. So that, uh, I, the idea of what we can do in terms of having more pediatric rheumatologists available, um, there are 
universities that don't have a pediatric rheumatologist. Right at this moment, OHSU does not have a pediatric rheumatologist uh, over at Dornbecker. So uh, it's, it's something where we hope to help get more and more to really help provide care in the way that I think patients with lupus should be taken care of if they're kids. So my take home points. Kids get lupus and tend to be more severe overall than adults. It just got to, you, you, don't have the cutaneous lupus that the adults have in terms of percentage, and it's something in which you just need to be aware of that. Um, diagnosis and treatment of lupus during adolescence has its own, and I'll say, unique challenges. Um, and that care of this patient population can best be served by pediatric rheumatologists if they're available. That's what I have for you guys. Our next speaker is Dr. Edith Vickers, the clinic director at the Anne Howe Natural Care Clinic, located here in Portland, Oregon. Dr. Vickers graduated from the University of Toronto, the National College of Naturopathic Medicine, and the Oregon College of Oriental Medicine. While she treats all illnesses for the past 25 plus years, her practice is focused on women's health, immune disorders, cancer, and chronic diseases. Dr. Vickers uses acupuncture, Chinese herbs, hydrotherapy, injection therapy, diet, and nutritional supplements to assist her patients in achieving better health and balance. She collaborates with allopathic doctors, therapists, and other members of the health team to ensure the best possible treatment for her patients. Throughout the years of practice, she has taught Chinese herb classes and acupuncture technique classes and for the past 12 years, she has been a supervising physician on the NCNM Chinese Medicine Shift. Dr. Vickers often gives lectures on treating illness through natural medicine. She's a doting grandmother of adorable one-year-old twins who love to garden and preserve the bounty for winter use and play with her three dogs. Join me in welcoming Dr. Edie Vickers. Very good. So I'm going to talk about lupus and um, just some simple things that you can do. We hear that with the medicines there are a lot of side effects. So things that you can do to counteract the side effects that are safe, um, accessible, and hopefully um, effective. So I'm going to basically talk about five different things. I'm going to start with exercise because we all know all of us need to exercise. So what we've learned with the studies is that if we look at the studies, we all need to exercise. It's good for our bones, it's good for our heart, it's good for our mind, sense of well-being, it decreases stress, it decreases inflammation. It's good for all of us. But when you have a chronic disease such as lupus, which has a great inflammatory component and is hard on your heart, hard on your kidneys, Exercise becomes that piece that actually is a treatment. Not only is it good for you, but it's part of the treatment that you should do. And the should is the piece. How do I do it when I'm feeling so fatigued or I have such joint pain I can hardly get out of bed? I haven't had enough sleep. And what we're understanding now looking at the studies is that with exercise you can actually break it down. So can you set your timer on your kitchen clock and walk around your kitchen or around your house if, or around your apartment for five minutes before you sit down. When you get up to go to the bathroom, can you take an extra loop before you sit back down? So every little bit above baseline actually aids, helps. Well, the goal is 30 minutes a day. So if you break that 30 minutes a day into five, six minute segments, does that seem more accessible? Can you have bands when you're sitting and use bands in your chair that you do for five minutes at a time for six times a day. All of those things actually add up over baseline. Studies show that if you add even doing range of motion exercises, if you're in bed, doing range of motion exercises in bed for 30 minutes, not all at once, broken up, can actually make a difference. So when they look at lupus and they look at exercise, the studies say that while people are in, they usually do them for three month periods of time. It's usually two to three times a week for 30 minutes. You usually have a personal trainer. While people have that personal trainer and they're doing it, they're 30 minutes, two to three times a week, 
people are able to do that. But as soon as the personal trainer goes away, compliance goes down and people aren't able to sustain it because they don't have someone there saying, how are you doing? Keep going. Yes, you can do this. And there, it's harder for us to do that in our own head than it is to have someone cheerleading us on. So it's like, how can we do that for ourselves? So some of the things that I talk to my patients about is get YouTube. If you have access to a computer, you can put up little YouTube videos. There are many YouTube videos, five minute little segments that do bands, that do, you know, walking, that can encourage you to just walk. Moderate walking is great. So anything that you can do above baseline is beneficial. So I always talk about if you're not doing any exercise at all, start with five minutes a day. You're worth five minutes a day. We're all worth five minutes a day. And do that for a week. And if you can do it for a week, then the next week try 10 minutes a day. And if you can do that, then the next week add five more minutes until you get up to um, 30 minutes a day. Now we've heard about the steroids and what steroids does to weight. We all know that when you're on a dose of steroids, you gain weight. One of the things that we can do with that, there's some studies that show that after eating, 30 minutes after eating, if you move for 10 minutes, that that actually increases your metabolism a little bit. So there's some balance with that. You're going to gain weight on steroids. That's, I mean, that's just the side effect. But we might be able to modulate that a little bit with a little movement. And I'm not talking about signing up for the marathon. I'm just talking about moderate walking around your house. You don't need to be in a gym. If you can get outside, that's great. You know, you can do it when the sun isn't at its peak. So you can do it in the morning, you can do it later at night. But 30, minute, 30 minutes, so 10 minutes after each meal, moving, helps to increase your metabolism. So that's a goal to think about. So this is a study, this is actually um, a comparison, a retrospective study, looking at seven different studies with lupus. And how does exercise affect fatigue? And all of the studies across the board, whether they were for 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, two to three times a day, showed that if you could do that for at least 30 days and 90 days, your energy increased. So we all want to try and move. Just do it is, the, is basically the idea with movement. Vitamin D, so in Portland, Oregon, the average serum level of vitamin D is 15 nanograms per DL. That's insufficient, it's deficient. Normal is 30. Optimal is probably, there's much controversy on this, but optimal is somewhere probably around 40 to 50. So pretty much everyone in Portland, Oregon needs vitamin D. So as I was saying, the 25-hydroxy vitamin D, that's the blood test, that's the best indicator, and we want that to at least be 30. We really would like it to be 40. Most of the studies show that at about 40, joint pain goes down, arthralgias go down, fatigue levels actually go down. There were a few studies on African-American women and vitamin D, and they found that women that African-American women actually have lower vitamin D than do Caucasian women. Both are deficient, but African-American women tend to have less vitamin D than do um, Caucasian women. Fish oil. We've heard a lot about fish oil. We've heard that it's good for our heart. We've heard that it's good for our brain. We've heard that we should just eat fish. But then we hear there's mercury in the fish and that there are pesticides in the fish and we shouldn't eat fish because there's too much contamination in the fish. So what do we do? It's a good question. So the two things that we're looking for in fish oil are the omega-3 fatty acids, eicosapentaenoic acid, EPA. So that's the main one that's used for decreasing inflammation in our body. And docehexanoic acid, DHA, and that's the main one we think about in terms of nerves right, in terms of the brain. So we know that um, there are omega-6 fatty acids. We hear, well, just take flax seeds, just, t you know, um, do flax oil, do evening primrose oil, because those omega-6 fatty acids also contain omega-3 fatty acids, the alpha-linoleic acid. And our body will just convert those to the EPA and to the DHA. 
But studies have shown that we're not, as humans, we're actually not very good converters of the omega-6, omega-3 into DHA and EPA. So I would say that we need to actually take fish oil or we need to eat the fish. So what they say is a portion, two to three servings of fish a week, and usually it's a cooked three, um, three ounce serving of fish. And I next slide has the how much per, whether it's cod, mackerel, tuna, salmon, caviar is the most, contains about 1.25 grams of EPA plus DHA a day. So usually we're looking for 1.5 grams of fish oil, EPA, DHA a day. So, you know, it's doable with a fatty fish. So we can see that caviar in a three ounce serving has five grams, right, of EPA and DHA. Most of us are eating salmon. That's at the 1.5. So salmon actually is pretty plentiful here in the Northwest. It's easy to get. Costco has it all the time, you know, and, and a serving of salmon three times a week gives you one and a half grams of fish oil a day. So if you can eat, you know, salmon, that's great. So you can look, there are many different things. So if you don't have access to fish or you don't like fish or you're sensitive to fish, then think about having, taking a fish oil supplement. And there are many. So there's been some controversy lately where there was a study that came out from England and it looked at over-the-counter fish oil supplements. And they said, is actually what's in the fish oil, what the <laughs> label claims is in the fish oil, what's in the fish oil? Turned out that about 50% it was not true. So if you're going to do over-the-counter fish oil, you want to do a good brand. So you might want to talk to your doctor about what is a good brand. And what I would say about a good brand, I have no affiliation, is that one that's independently tested. So there are many in the Northwest that are independently tested. So what it says on the label has gone to an outside <coughs> lab and have been independently tested that, yes, actually what it says on the label is true. So, thing, so places that you can get over the counter here, that would be Nordic Naturals, Carlson's, Eskimo 3. There are many um, <coughs> brands here that are readily available. I think it's preferable to eat. I always think it's better to eat your nutrition rather than take it as a supplement. And we all know that most of you take a lot of supplements and it's hard. How do you take all those supplements? How do you make that medicine your food? Hard enough to take what you need to take, let alone adding something else in. But I do think that fish oil is important. Here's a study looking at fish oils and decreasing cardiovascular disease in patients with lupus. So we know that cardiovascular disease is prevalent in patients with lupus. And so in this study, they were looking at um, if you take fish oil and they use different markers to see what, how do we decrease inflammation and how do we decrease um, insulin sensitivity, in, insensitivity. And what they found was by taking 1,500 milligrams of EPA plus DHA a day, a day actually decreased inflammatory markers, C-reactive protein, nitric oxide. So fish oil, I think it's good as a general. It usually is not contraindicated. Always check with your doctor first. I tried to pick things that were pretty unanimous and not contraindicated with any of the meds that you're on. Fish oil does thin the blood a little bit when you get up into the high doses, so if you're on a blood thinner, you need to talk to your doctor about that. Acupuncture, okay. Another thing that's interesting, acupuncture. So I've been an acupuncturist for 28 years now, and um, I think it's fabulous for pain. A lot of people, I, I see people before they're diagnosed with lupus. They come in because they think they have fibromyalgia, or they think they have chronic sore throats, mouse sores, they have a rash, it's not quite a malar rash, but it comes and goes. They have a lot of fatigue, they're not sleeping. Um, they have digestive problems. They have, they have a tendency to get pneumonia or tendency to get pleurisy. They have chest pain. And so one of the things that, well, we're trying to do blood tests and do a workup, one of the things that can help alleviate symptoms 
Acupuncture isn't a cure, but it's a great modality to help to alleviate symptoms and provide some relief. It is a needle. The needles are very thin. They're paper, they're hair thin. I brought some with me if anyone's interested to see what they look like. It's not, I think when you have a chronic illness, you've had a lot of blood draws and you've had a lot of exposures to needles. And so when I say it's the application of needles in many different places in your body, people think, I don't want another needle. But I, th I would try to think of it as a fine hair inserted just very minutely into the skin to stimulate and cause an anti-inflammatory relaxation effect. So it's, acupuncture's been around for a long time, 4,000 years. We're very lucky in Portland, Oregon. There's actually two colleges of acupuncture medicine, Chinese medicine here in Portland, Oregon. There's the Oriental College of um, Oriental Medicine here, it's actually right next door, right there, right a few blocks down there, and that's um, been around since um, 83. I was in their first graduating class. And then NCNM, where I teach now, which is the um, National College of Natural Medicine, they have a program, a, a classical Chinese medical program that's been around for 12 years, I believe, and I teach there now. So you have two programs, which is great, so there are a lot of acupuncturists around, and there are a lot of um, clinics that offer low-cost treatment. So there's a lot of accessibility. It's recognized by the FDA. It's, um, there really are no side effects. You might get a bruise from where the needle's inserted, but really there are no side effects. Most people benefit by having increased energy, better sleep, better digestion, less pain, um, less inflammation. So I think it's worth um, looking at and at least trying. So there's a clinic um, called the IEP clinic, the Immune Enhancement Project, which um, was started 22 years ago, 23 years ago, and it's a nonprofit clinic that offers um, acupuncture and Chinese medicine for chronic disease. And they've been looking at lupus over the last 10 years or so, and they've started, just in the last six months, they've started offering treatment for people with lupus. So it's a great idea. There's a handout over on the table by Molly's picture over on that table there by Sabuti Dharmananda that talks about what the program is. And it's a very low cost free, if you qualify for free, to go and try Chinese medicine if you choose to do that. So, I know that both schools have clinics where they offer low-cost clinics, so it's really accessible in Portland, Oregon. So I think I talked mostly about what is acupuncture. So this is one of my patients who I was treating was undergoing chemotherapy, and I was treating acupuncture for um, side effects of chemotherapy, mainly nausea in her ear. So um, the needles, you place the needles. As you can see, there's five little needles in her ear and um, they're left in for 15 to 20 minutes. Each of the needles are disposable and sterile. They're left in, yes, as I said, um, for 15 to 20 minutes and then taken out and discarded. And patients generally feel relaxed. A lot of people fall asleep on the table. So, I mean, it seems odd that you would have needles in your body and fall asleep, but that really is the common reaction. Okay, the next I just wanted to talk about a food that I often recommend, cherry juice, cherries. So what's great about cherry juice and cherries? Cherries actually decrease C-reactive protein and nitric oxide in the body. They're a great anti-inflammatory. So just adding a little bit of cherry juice or eating 50 cherries, which of course then you might get cherry belly, but in the Northwest we have lots of you know, great cherries, um, is really great for helping to lower inflammation. It's really great for pain, you know, joint pain. So it's something that's accessible, easy to try, doesn't interfere with any of your meds. This, I brought up this little study because some people say, well, I can't do any juice because juice is too high, you know, it's too glycemic and make my blood sugar go up and I'm, I'm worried about that. But cherry juice actually tends to be a low glycemic fruit, which is great. So in this study, it's a small study. Most of the studies done on food are small. I'll give it that. But they saw no change in blood sugar or insulin levels. So cherry juice really is a low glycemic fruit. 
So what, how much cherry juice do you need to do? So as I said, it's 50 cherries. It's um, equivalent to two tablespoons of the concentrate. Most of the studies are done on 80 to 100 cherries or on 50 cherries. So it's one to two tablespoons. So you can take concentrate, which is available, Freddy's, all the, you know, Trader Joe's, and dilute it into an eight ounce glass and drink your cherry juice while you take your pills. So you're getting a little anti-inflammatory while you're taking your pills. So just to recap, five ways, exercise, exercise, exercise for all of us. We all need to exercise. Vitamin D, consider taking some vitamin D. Talk to your doctor about that, vitamin D. Fish oil, think about including fish in your diet or incorporating um, some over-the-counter fish oil. Cherry juice, think about eating some cherries. We're just gonna come into cherry season. It's supposed to be early this year. Um, and acupuncture. Consider trying some acupuncture. Thank you. Now I'd like to turn to B.J. Kavner to update us on legislation affecting lupus patients. B.J. Kavner is the founding executive director of One in Four Health. One in Four Health is a collaborative working to improve the needs of people living with chronic health conditions through advocacy, education, and policy. We work with our partners, health care providers, CCOs, insurers, policymakers, and patients to reach those goals. Our mission is to be a voice for patients through education, advocacy, and policy. Mr. Kavner served as vice chair for the Oregon Health Insurance Technology Oversight Committee Legal and Policy Work Group. The name one in four reflects the statistic that one in four Americans is living with two or more chronic health conditions. We believe that only by preventing and treating people with chronic health conditions will we achieve the goals of improved community health set forth by the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act and the Oregon Health Authority. Please join me in welcoming B.J. Kaffner. So you've heard some great information so far, and I wanted to ask, uh, in following your lead, would you all just join me in a quick standing up, if that's something that's comfortable? I'm going to put this over to the side because I'm going to read my notes. And I'm not going to do a PowerPoint because I want you to just talk. OK. Place your feet firmly on the ground. Be comfortable. Just make yourself as comfortable as possible, if you can. Just reach up. Overhead, deep breath in, and as you exhale, bring your arms down, back to your chest, and congratulations, you all just did yoga. <laughs> How do you feel? So I'm going to talk this morning about policy and what public policy is and what it isn't, but I also want to share a little bit about my journey. Um, I've been living with HIV for over 20 years now, and I come to the work that I do in policy, and especially in healthcare policy, from a very selfish place. I want to stay healthy. I want to stay alive. And the reason I founded the organization that we have is because we want to teach other people how to do this as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what's going on with federal and state policy. Um, but before I do that, how many of you have ever heard of Susan Sontag? I see a show of hands. So Susan Sontag was an amazing writer, and she was the first person to look at from a perspective as a writer is what disease is and what disease does to us and how we become diseased and how we take that language in and how it harms us and it keeps us. So my organization is called One in Four Chronic Health because we believe that we're working with people with chronic health conditions. Not disease, but health conditions. This is her book on, that she wrote. It's called Illness and Metaphor that she wrote surviving her breast cancer treatment. And then she later wrote in 1988 uh, because so many of her friends were affected by HIV and AIDS. She wrote a Oh, I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Is that, do I need to stand in front of here? Or? Can everybody hear me? 
Okay, so a little bit louder, not a problem. Yes. So she also wrote a book in 1988 that's part of this. It talks about what people were going through and what her friends were going through culturally around HIV and AIDS. So, um, who knows what public policy is? What's public policy? So public policy is anything that impacts the work that a governing body, and in this case the state, the federal government, local, does. There's different types of public policy. Obviously we want to have police forces in place, we want fire departments in place, we want to make sure that our roads are safe, that we have schools. But I work in healthcare policy. Healthcare policy is putting forth laws, and in some cases removing laws and barriers, that help patients and help community health overall. Um, we do this through a number of ways. Most of the time it's through putting laws forward, and we do this uh, either on our own or working with other organizations. Sometimes people will come to us and say, you know, we think it's a really good idea if we do this. I mean, here's a stupid law. It says that I have to have all of these things before I can get access to treatment. And, you know, we look at it and say, wow, that is a stupid law. Let's see what we can do to change that. And that's what we do. So, this is 2015. We've had the Affordable Care Act in place for 10 years. And I should just ask, do you mind if I walk around as you're trying to film me? Okay, good. Um, we've had the Affordable Care Act in place for five years now. And yet, we still have numerous votes in Congress to repeal it. Um, can I see a show of hands as to who's benefited from the Affordable Care Act? That's pretty good. I would say that everybody has. And I would say that everybody has because one of the most important provisions that has allowed people with pre-existing medical conditions to, for the first time, be able to purchase health insurance. So that's an everybody provision. Um, that's important, and I'll get back to that when we talk a little bit about Oregon. So um, I'll get back to that. But right now, we have the Affordable Care Act in place. We have most of the provisions that have held up in court. We have a very interesting court case that's coming up called King versus Burwell that is before the Supreme Court. It's already been argued. We're waiting for the Supreme Court's decision. We're waiting on a lot of really important decisions this year from the court. It's gonna be some interesting times in June and July. So who knows about King versus Burwell? What's King versus Burwell? Well, to, to take away the subsidies from the states. Exactly. The issue is specifically whether or not the subsidies that people get to purchase plans in and outside the exchange, but mostly in the exchange, are legal, or whether or not they are not legal. So that's the whole issue, and that's the issue that's before the court right now. Now, the good <coughs> news is that most states have cited already that, look, even if this turns out to be declared uh, unconstitutional, which is what things generally are before the, the Supreme Court, when they're argued at that point, the states are still going to work to make sure that people have access to insurance who depended on those subsidies. So that's the good news. So that means no one's going to have to immediately lose their coverage. The other interesting thing that we're working on around federal policy is trying to get guidance the states, what the federal government did with the Affordable Care Act is it gave the states a lot of leeway to be able to do what they want. This is called a states' rights issue, and we see these a lot of times when we have issues that come up around things like medical marijuana or legal marijuana, uh, gambling, um, Second Amendment rights, excuse me, First Amendment rights with regard to gun ownership. These are all states' rights issues. And the federal government wanted to be able to give states the opportunity to provide the, for their citizens um, in a way that they weren't binding their hands or restricting them. So we have a lot of these states' rights issues that are coming up. And in 2017, so a year and a half from now, the states have the ability, if they choose, to waive whether or not they want to allow the anti-discrimination provisions in the Affordable Care Act for Medicaid patients. That means if you're a Medicaid patient, 
you would not necessarily be allowed to access care based on a prior condition, access care uh, that does not discriminate against you in any way, state or form. That means that if you have private insurance, you still have the federal protections, but if you have Medicaid, you don't. The government may have control over your health care, but as I look at it, it, more importantly, Medicaid patients would have a lower standard of care than private insurance patients and even Medicare patients. But isn't that happening now? Oh, yes, it is. Yeah. So there's a bill. <laughs> it's called Senate Bill 309. Let me tell you a little story about Senate Bill 309. So we had this incredible coalition of people together to, to work on against Senate Bill 309. And for us, it was a no-brainer. Our argument was simple. It's like, look, Oregon is a progressive state, but we take care of our own. We don't necessarily want outsiders telling us what to do, but at the same time, we want to enshrine and protect the rights of the people who live here in our borders, our citizens. We've expanded Medicaid to more than 1.1 million people in this state alone. We're one of the largest, yes, we're one of the largest Medicaid expansion states, period. Because we'd had a fantastic public health plan and the Oregon Health Plan, but because it was a lottery system, there were so many people who needed care but weren't able to afford it, that now we were able to actually get care to these people. So, we ran a bill, and this bill said that you had to take the federal law, which says you can't discriminate, and put that or enshrine it into Oregon statute, make it Oregon law, so that when 2017 comes and goes, that it's still the law. The bill came up for a vote in the Senate Committee on Health Care. Every single member, both parties, equally split, as committees are, voted to move the bill forward to the next step, which was Ways and Means, and from that it would have gone to the House for a vote, and from then it would have gone to the floor for a vote, then to the governor's desk for a signature. Except the chairperson, who is a nurse, decided to move this bill forward. Because she is the chair and she has the power, the bill did not move forward. So this is obviously a very high priority for us. And this is a very high priority, and this is one of the things I speak to everybody about. Because almost all of us in this room would have not been able to get health care before the Affordable Care Act. Now this is not saying that you're not going to be able to get health care, but what this is saying is that if your medication is too expensive and the state doesn't want to cover it or coordinated care organization or CCOs don't want to cover it, you no longer have the law on your back to protect you to say this is a necessary coverage and this is a necessary provision. So stay tuned. We also ran another bill that was called Cap the Copay or House Bill 2951. How many of you have noticed that your medication copays have gone up over the last two years? Like significantly? Like remember when you had a high-end copay that was maybe 75 bucks, you know, and all of a sudden in January of this year you go to fill it and you're paying 50% of the cost of this medication. You're paying 50% of the cost of the medication. House bill, there'll be notes. Don't worry about it. House Bill 2951. Okay. So we ran a bill that said, you know what? We want to limit the cost of out-of-pocket medication for people. We want to bring it down to $100 a month for people on gold, silver, and platinum plans, and there really aren't that many platinum plans in Oregon, and $200 a month for people on bronze. And the reason being is that bronze plans are so inexpensive that there was just absolutely no way that they could make any money on doing this. So the idea was next year we're gonna switch you to a silver plan and we're gonna show you how this is actually gonna save you money in the long run. So we ran this bill and we had some uh, objections from the insurance industry. And the insurance industry decided to run another bill. And I called it everything but the price because the insurance industry bill and their argument was, well, we're not responsible for the high cost of your medication. The pharmaceutical industry is. And to which my response is very simply, you know what? We're the patients. We need you and you to work nice. Otherwise, 
we don't get well or we die. So don't tell me your problems. Stop naming stadiums. Shut up and sit down. Let's talk. <laughs> so they ran the everything but transparency, which was going to reveal everything except the actual price that a drug is negotiated with with an insurance company because legally that is a federally protected trade secret and you can't reveal that. And this was their answer. And their answer was, well, we're going to reveal, you know, how much money pharmaceutical companies are making on this and that's going to drive the price down. I said, well, yeah, maybe at some point in the future. But we're actually talking about having people pay less money per month for their drugs so that people don't stop taking their drugs, so that people don't have to make a choice between drugs and gas or car payment or food or rent. And you'd be surprised how many of the members of our legislature don't even understand this concept. And we have a part-time legislator, legislature. They all have real jobs. Amazing thing happens when you go to the Capitol. So this bill has been bound to a work group with the insurance company's bill to try and see what we can do to move forward. Now, here's the thing. Who knows what your out-of-pocket max is? every year. Let me hear. 3,000? 3, Six. Six. So it depends on your plan. But the average out-of-pocket maximum or the, the most expensive out-of-pocket maximum in Oregon for a medical plan is $6,700 for an individual person. Once you've reached that, everything is covered at 100%. We're seeing people who are paying that in January. I don't know about you, but January, I don't know. I certainly don't have an extra $6,700 $6, laying around to pay for my drugs. So what our bill did was, and this is a fancy accounting term, but amateurize or break down the amount of medications that people take over a 12-month period. So the insurance companies weren't losing anything. They were simply allowing you to make payments as you go. So that was one of our bills that's sort of also in limbo. We're also watching another bill. It's called House Bill 2638 that would create two lists. It would create, and this is again for Medicaid, it would create a prioritized list and it would create a list that says do not cover, ever. You're not allowed to get this drug. So if you have a drug that's on the okay list that stops working for you, as you know, we all know that this happens, and the drug you need is on the B list, what are you supposed to do? That one's still in play, and we're fighting it. And they came up with another one that would take drugs that the FDA has approved and that the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services, CMS, the largest payer and provider of medication services in the country, and possibly the world, they said that once the FDA and CMS approved a drug, Oregon was not allowed to cover it for six months. This violates federal law. Why? It's too expensive. So, very interesting thing happened last year, well, two years ago. We started getting a new class of medication to treat and cure hepatitis C. Up until that point, hepatitis C was the leading cause the leading cause of liver cancer death in the U.S. We eliminated, or we have the potential to eliminate that, and we can cure 98% of patients. And just think about that for a second. 98% of patients, we're talking at least 5 million Americans. I know. The problem? It's a very expensive treatment. It averages $100,000. For, for a year? For one time, treatment's taken generally for a 12-week period. In some cases, patients have to take it up to 24 weeks. And that's it. You're cured. You no longer have hepatitis C. Well, the average cost of lifetime treatment of a patient with hepatitis C averages $1.2 million. And obviously that's a reduced lifetime. 
and that, call, that considers the $20,000 now when someone's healthy uh, as you're monitoring them as they progress to uh, uh, hepatitis is measured in scores of fibrosis and uh, ranges of degrees. So if you have somebody who is less fibrotic at stage four, excuse me, at stage one that moves to stage three and stage four, which is obviously more advanced and this liver shuts down, then it becomes even more expensive to be able to treat those patients. So that's what we're looking at. So that's some of the bills that are being currently worked on in Oregon. And now, this is the point that what can we do about this? Well, the first thing you could do is register to vote. And if you're not registered, please do. The second thing you could do is things like this, is come, is find out what's going on. And then the third thing is to get in contact with your legislators. I can't tell you how many times I have people say to me, what, how does this impact the people in my district? And when I'm able to say, you know what, let me introduce you to somebody who lives in your district and let me have you tell them their, their own story. And that really makes a huge difference. And it, it's incredible. So the work that we're doing is to be able to continue to make sure that patients have access to affordable treatment and medication, that we don't put unnecessary barriers and discrimination in place for that, that we treat all people as people living with chronic conditions and not as diseased patients, and that we do whatever we can to remove the stigma associated with disease and with chronic conditions, and that we work to continue to advocate for more funding at the federal level for research and development, and that we lean on the, uh, our federal delegation and organizations like the Health and Human Service Organization, National Cancer Institute, uh, Centers for Disease Control, to say we need better guidance as to what we're doing at the state level and we need your help in doing this. So that's all I have for you. I'm happy to answer any questions when we're doing the Q&A and thank you very much. And In regards to fish oil, what time of day or should you take it with food? In terms of fish oil, so some people find that they take fish oil and they say, oh, I burp it up, tastes fishy, tastes rancid, I don't want to take it. So one of the tricks is you can keep your fish oil, if you take it in capsules, keep it in the freezer. Frozen fish oil, take it, take, eat a bite of food when you're starting, you can take it breakfast, lunch, dinner, take a bite of food, take your fish oil and eat the rest of your meal. You should have no problem with regurgitation, burping it up, feeling nauseous. I take mine in the morning with my smoothie every morning and um, I don't have an issue. If you're, one of the things they say that if you burp up fish oil after you've taken pills that it means that the fish oil's rancid. So if you have fish oil, make sure you check the date. It is an oil and it does go bad. There actually is vegetarian or vegan, um, EPA and DHA. It comes from different seaweeds is actually where it comes from. And I'm just wondering, we'd have to see, you know, whether that was also an allergen. What I usually say when I'm trying, um, because I treat a lot of people who are vegan, so they don't want to um, consume fish. Um, or people who are sensitive, uh, anaphylactic. And so um, I would take a capsule, open it up, and put it on your wrist and see if you get an allergic sensitivity to it. Okay. Try that. But there, over the, there are over-the-count ve vegan EPA, DHA supplements, yes. Okay. Doctor, what about krill oil? Krill oil is still, I mean, krill oil is still considered in that um, fish, fish category. Yeah. So that would not work in terms of allergy. Her, her doctor tested her for vitamin D and her levels were below one and so Edie was going to recommend what she should do. No, so in my opinion the once a week 50,000 um, a week is fine but when you discontinue that so usually you're put on that until your levels get up to into the normal range and then when you discontinue that that's when you would start the 2,000 a day. So you're either going to continue that forever and ever and that's fine or you're going to discontinue that at some point once you're, you know, your levels are normal and then you would switch over. Does that make sense? Yeah.
So what she said is that she's on 50,000 IUs of vitamin D2, which is the um, prescribed vitamin D per week, as well as 2,000 IUs of vitamin D3 per day. She's been on that for five years, and she still doesn't have a sufficient vitamin D serum level. Thank you. What can she do about that? So that's, um, that's about a... So some people... So some people do not absorb vitamin D. I have a few of those patients in my practice, and we try other ways other than through your digestive system. So one option is to actually get liquid vitamin D3 and apply it to your wrist and absorb it through your skin. Another is to do sublingual as opposed to through your digestive system to go under your tongue so it absorbs directly into your bloodstream and see if that will bring your numbers up. So those would be two suggestions that are easy to try. So, so she's wondering if there's an options to IM injection of vitamin B12. So something that sometimes goes along with autoimmune, different autoimmune diseases is pernicious anemia. So we need a certain substance in our stomach to absorb vitamin B12 from our food and it's also our main uptake is in our distal small intestine and so sometimes if we have inflammation in our digestive system we don't absorb the nutrition from the food that we eat so studies used to say if you had the diagnosis of pernicious anemia that you needed an injection of B12 usually 1000 micrograms IM injection once a month twice you know now you're getting it twice a month but Recent research has shown that you can do sublingual drops. So there are sublingual drops that you can do that you can get over the counter. You need to talk to your doctor, say you're frustrated. Many people do not like to do the shots. It's too much and it hurts. So, um, and it's another office visit. So there are definite, there's definitely research supporting um, the use of sublingual vitamin B12 drops under your tongue for the treatment of pernicious anemia that works just as well so you can see if that's an option for you can you tell me the difference between vitamin 2 D2 and D3 so vitamin D2 is um, a vegetarian um, non fish oil source and vitamin um, vitamin D3 vitamin D2 is plant-based and vitamin D3 is not Vitamin D3 tends to be um, sus more sustainable in your system for a longer period of time. So if you were on the prescription vitamin D2, um, when you go off of that and you do not take oral vitamin D3, your levels will drop again. So, that's, so you either need to continue on your, vitamin, your prescription vitamin D2, or when you go off, you need to start supplementing oral vitamin D, otherwise your levels will fall. That's what I'm saying. So in general, the prescription, I think there only is prescription vitamin D2, but I don't know that for a fact, but I believe that's true. And then most of the over-the-counter is vitamin D3. So the cherry juice. So most of the studies to decrease C-reactive protein, which is an inflammatory marker in your blood, so to decrease inflammation, to help with joint pain, getting up in the morning and feeling like you can get out of bed with less pain, um, 50 cherries a day, sour or sweet, seem to have the same research, two tablespoons of concentrate, or six ounces of juice. So 50 cherries, two tablespoons, six ounces of juice. So the question is, uh, have there been an increased incidence of rheumatic conditions in adults or kids? Both. In adults and kids more recently compared to 10 years or 20 years ago? Uh, and the uh, answer is uh, maybe, of course. The, um, one of the questions is, uh, so we've been seeing more patients with rheumatic conditions in kids, and I'll speak towards kids because that's who I take care of. Um, so the question is, is the incidence greater? Are we getting a change in the referral pattern? Are we, as subspecialists, getting more of the patients who may not have been coming to us previously 
And are we seeing them more? Are we seeing them more because we have more access, as we talked about earlier? Are there more of us around and more available to be able to get patients to us? Are people knowing that there are pediatric rheumatologists, so pediatricians and family practitioners are referring them to us? Um, those we don't know. So there's nothing that definitively says, based upon envir the environment, are there exposures, foods, or other things that may be increasing the incidence of rheumatic conditions or even autoimmune conditions. The question is, what age as a pediatric rheumatologist do we stop seeing patients? Uh, every institution is different. I can tell you that we typically would stop seeing new patients. So if someone is older than 18, they would not come to our clinic but go to an adult rheumatologist. If they're in our clinic, we will typically follow them through college or through at least age 21. Uh, and that's what our policy is. Most places are going to follow patients uh, and see them up to age 18. So the question, and I'm going to paraphrase a little, is uh, if someone is around the age of 18, is there something that a pediatric rheumatologist is going to be better at identifying than an adult rheumatologist is going to be able to identify? And I would say the answer is no. Around 18, your, the characteristics of the rheumatic condition that they have is going to fit more like that of patients who are older, more adult type, than pediatric type. So I feel very comfortable if an 18-year-old is being evaluated and cared for by an adult rheumatologist that their ex ex expertise and experience is going to serve them well as well as the patient and their family. The question is, if you have one autoimmune condition, are you more susceptible to get another one? I'm, I'm pondering this question only because uh, we absolutely see patients who have type 1 diabetes who develop juvenile idiopathic arthritis, for example, or who have inflammatory bowel disease, who have thyroid disease as well. What I don't know is the, incident, is the incidence greater in our population for developing that second condition than the normal population. Uh, so my gestalt, my, my gut feeling is yes but it's not that much higher than the normal population. Yeah, I'm not, like I said, I, I would say I'm, uh, that I don't know, to be, to be perfectly honest. Well, might I offer that, I mean, I'm, I'm not a doctor. I'm the first person to, to, to say that. I often say I'm not a lawyer. But I, I think that one of the things that we see is because we are paying so much attention to patients that we notice other conditions more uh, readily than we might in just the general patient population. So I don't know, it, 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 there may not be a correlation, it may be a coincidence. Um, I, I think that there is something to be said about, I know my own personal experience that, you know, my allergies were nothing compared to what they were uh, after I became HIV positive, and that's just an autoimmune issue in itself. But uh, I, I think it's not necessarily, I think we might just be noticing it more and the jury's still out on the data, but it's a great question. There is a participant in our audience who's a biologist who believes that there are certain autoimmune conditions that are, predispose the patient to other specific autoimmune conditions. And we certainly do see things pair with respects to, um, for example, um, thyroid disease and uh, lupus, for example. The, the question is whether or not um, there, are any, there is anything that we can do to alleviate some of the unnecessary medications that patients are required to try, and we call that fail-first formula therapy. Um, insurers call it step therapy. And um, if that is with specifically with the Oregon Health Plan, uh, if, if there's anything that could be done about that, and also with certain tests um, that could be done. <sighs> so the answer is we're working on it. Uh, sometimes it, it, it's obvious, and I, I know it's, it's a very frustrating thing for providers as well, because I'll, in many cases what happens is patients simply say, you know what, this isn't worth it. I mean, these are not symptoms that are causing me immediate health complications right now. 
so I'm not even going to try and worry about it. Um, we're trying to limit fail-first formularies, especially if patients are coming from another provider or another insurer and are able to say, look, I have documented evidence that this is a treatment that works for me, uh, but it's definitely something that we need to continue working on. Uh, it, it goes to the cost of medical um, practice and, and medical treatment, but you know, we know that prescription medications are expensive and we know is also that uh, uh, brand name prescription medications are more expensive, but Oregon has a 92% generic fill rate. And that means 92% of the prescriptions that are written and filled in the state across all insurance are generic. So we really are doing the best to stretch that, that dollar. I, I can add one thing. I think uh, if you have the opportunity to work with providers who know the system with respects to what medication it is you're trying to get to and what needs to happen to be able to get to that point, it can get you there in the quickest way possible. Uh, there are certain insurers where you have to be on X, Y, and Z before you can get on to W. And knowing that and knowing how long you have to be there and what that point is that is going to satisfy that helps you get to the point you need to get to as quickly as possible, even though you still have to jump through those hoops. I would also add that, you know, many people aren't aware of the appeals process that Oregon Health Plan offers. So if you're a member of a coordinated care organization or a CCO, you have appeals processes within the CCO when you're denied access to a medication or treatment. On top of that, you also have appeals processes with the Oregon Health Authority, uh, which it's a two-step appeal process. If it's a urgent condition, they're required to get you an answer within 72 hours. If it's life or death, 24 hours, and you still have the ability to go to an administrative a judge, excuse me, and plead your case. And many people who now rely on CCOs don't know that this exists, and this is an option to you know to use as well. So the question was, does Apple Health have a Medicaid appeal process as well? Um, is Apple Health a coordinated care organization? Washington State. Washington State? Like OHP. OK. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. OK, thank you. Um, yes, they do. And there's also an insurance commissioner. And Washington and Oregon both have very fantastic consumer-friendly uh, commissioners, insurance commissioners. So what I would recommend that you do is to look at the Apple Health website and to look at um, what the appeals process is. And there's a wonderful organization that's based in Seattle called uh, Northwest Health Law Advocates, who we work with a lot on doing advocacy work for uh, Medicaid patients in Washington. And don't worry about writing all those down. I will get you all of this in an email. The question was, <laughs> uh, no, it's OK. That's OK. The, the question was in regarding uh, uh, Senate Bill 309, which was the anti-discrimination provision, with such uniform support from the committee, did the chairperson uh, share the information as to why she didn't want the bill, bill to move forward. And I can tell you what was on the record um, was th that it would be everything from that it would bankrupt the state to the governor didn't want it to the bill would be vetoed to the uh, House Health Committee chairperson didn't want it. Um, so those were the excuses that were given and th those were given directly to myself, to colleagues and to a couple of constituents. Yeah. But it is, it's like I said, it's, it's a concern. We're looking at rewriting a bill next year, and we're also looking at some federal guidance as to what we can do to put you know, this legislation in place, because it's, it's absolutely critical. That's all the time we have for today. Um, please, another round of applause for our speakers. <laughs>